Video games are one of the best forms of escapism out there, and they've definitely gotten a lot of us out of some dark times over the last few years. They can be a lot of fun, and great ways to unplug, but should we be thinking more about the games that we play? I know, weird question for someone who literally makes monthly video essays analyzing video games to ask, but what's the point? Is there value in it, or is video essay YouTube just a bunch of people nerding out for the sake of it? For showing off how well they can write a sentence or deconstruct the open world of a cowboy game? Well, let's get meta as fuck and analyze analyzing. Before we get into the video essay, I just wanted to jump in here and remind you to subscribe and like the video for more content like this every single month. It's free and really helps the channel grow. Thank you so much. In the beginning, there was no analysis. Video games were just a fun distraction. Arcades were more for hanging out and shooting for that high score. Back then, most games didn't even have a story. And when they did, they were mostly just a quick introductory blurb of text. Games were about action-packed fun first, and story was only there to justify what was happening on screen. It was context more than anything. But when video games started to expand and land on our home consoles, we had more time to think about the medium that we were interacting with. And so did the developers. As games got more involved, they started to say something. All your base are belong to us. But games spoke with much more than crunchy voice lines. As technology in the 80s and 90s rapidly evolved, with the economic booms in the US and Japan, we started to see more fleshed out stories with rich characters, plot twists, and even narrative themes. Now games weren't just a fun hobby or mindless pastime. They started to be an engaging storytelling medium for both players and developers alike. Slowly but surely, voice acting became more commonplace as it became cheaper to implement. Cutscenes began to make their way into more than just the beginning and end of a playthrough. And some stories even became interactive affairs, taking their cues from pen and paper tabletop games and choose your own adventure books. The player could start to impact the way things played out. Choices began to matter. Over the course of just 10 years, we went from Save the Princess to a time-traveling group of misfits averting global disasters while questioning how much impact an individual can have on the greater world around them through their actions. That's a pretty big leap in storytelling for a single decade. And this is where things really start to get interesting. This is the point in time where you could argue that video games became literature. Just like the Frankensteins and Great Gatsby's of the past, video games are a creative media with lasting power based on their artistic merit. And if there's anything our high school English teachers taught us, it's that literature is there for us to analyze. Hester Prynne didn't wear that scarlet letter for nothing after all. Majora's Mask being an allegory for loneliness and depression, the televisions in Little Nightmares 2 existing as a critique of passive consumerism, Cypher's name coming from the Arabic root of the word Saber, hinting at his sinister heel turn later on in Final Fantasy VIII, almost everything a creator folds into their media these days has some kind of meaning to it. You can absolutely play something like The Outer Wilds as a colorful science fiction romp, or you can engage with the themes of finding hope amidst the nihilism of a Groundhog Day style life cycle in a solar system on the brink of death. Nowadays, there's almost always an incentive to dig a bit deeper into the games we play. Even though I've seen plenty of comments since making video essays declaring, hey, just play the game. People who analyze games ruin the fun. Uh, no. I think that's a prime example of some anti-intellectual bull <laughs> I'm not here to tell you how to experience your games, but there is some merit to critical thinking, even while engaging with hobbies in your time off. If I notice that a game is trying to say something, I'm going to take the time to listen, and I encourage you to do the same. There's so many facets of video games that we can analyze, which makes it such a dynamic medium to dissect. This is Edward Hopper's Nighthawks. At first glance, it's a simple nighttime scene. A diner open late, a few patrons, a server, nothing special. But the more you look at it, the more details reveal themselves and the more questions arise. Why does this scene feel so tense? Who is this couple? A criminal duo? A husband and wife getting some grub after a late night movie? 
Is this man an undercover cop about to make an arrest? It's all up to interpretation and there's countless answers, but that's the main appeal of this piece. Mystery. Given just enough information to get the gears turning, an audience will naturally fill in the gaps as to what could be going on. That's why the unseen horror is always the scariest. The human mind was made to wander, to ponder, to wonder, and explore. So when video games give us a few breadcrumbs and a gentle nudge to find out more about our new environment, how could our analytical side not be engaged? I mean, that's the whole appeal of this opening moment in Breath of the Wild. Not a real video essay if you don't include that Zelda shot, right? Mystery is also a big part of why environmental storytelling has become so popular over the last decade and a half. The more small clues a player receives, the more likely they are to go looking further. Slowly piecing together the lore of who this boss character is, or why this big ass alien is vibing on the side of a building. There's a reason games using environmental storytelling techniques cultivate huge fan bases in online forums. The idea of being an unknown world's archaeologist of sorts is pretty enticing. Or, you know, letting other people do that work for you, but that's a different story. A moody atmosphere and a handful of cryptic messages can really go a long way to getting those mental gears turning. Video game stories do more than just make us ask what's going on in the game world, though. Like any lasting literature, they can also make us question the way we see the world around us as well. Because a video game narrative can be so much more intricate and nuanced than a movie or book, they can often explore much deeper symbolism and themes. I know, bet you didn't think all that time spent highlighting your copy of Catcher in the Rye in high school was going to have any bearing on your time playing Final Fantasy, but here we are. But what better way to explore the evils of the military-industrial complex than putting you in the sleeveless turtleneck of Cloud Strife, who suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder after his time in service? By the way, did you know he was a soldier? X, soldier boy. Narrative themes can be vehicles to help us confront questions we wouldn't otherwise. How do we feel about mortality? What is consciousness? Plenty of games tackle the ideas of environmentalism, too. Some with more nuance than others, but it's interesting how prevalent this theme has become over the lifespan of gaming. Huh. Maybe I should make a video essay about that. A lot of these questions come up in books and film, too, but in the medium of video games, themes like these can often hit a bit harder and give us more room to think about our stance on them because we're experiencing them along with the characters we control, not just as an outside observer. We're walking in their shoes. It's not just a thought exercise either. Analyzing these literary aspects of video game storytelling gives titles a voice beyond the medium, allowing them to speak about the world that we inhabit. Celeste is a great example of a game that you could simply enjoy as a tough precision platformer without ever diving any deeper. Its gameplay is engaging and the controls are airtight, but when you dig just past the surface, you can see it's a commentary about mental health and even transgender identity. It can be appreciated on so many different levels, either as a tough platformer that feels relieving to finish, or as a metaphor for overcoming our own internal struggles in real time along with Madeline. It's a game that plays gorgeously while also asking us to think about our internal struggles a little deeper, and it's a great example of how a video game can be used as a vehicle for empathy. If you'd like to see a wonderful deconstruction of the messages of mental health and transgender identity in the game, please go check out this video by Transparency. It's an incredible deep dive about a wonderful game, and they're wonderful creators. Go support them. But this is one of the main appeals about analyzing the games we love. It helps us more deeply appreciate the creation that the devs put so much time and heart into. Unpacking the themes and symbolism gives us more to chew on, but also lets us appreciate a game as more than just an amalgamation of button inputs and moving pixels. After decades of passively enjoying video games, learning about what goes into creating these titles gave me a new appreciation for playing them. Like when a piece of game design really works, knowing why it feels so good just heightens my level of respect for a game. The actual cogs and gears that make up the clockwork of a game. 
the mechanics, the design. Movement in Abzu feels really smooth and intuitive, unlike a lot of other 3D swimming experiences that I've played through. But knowing just how much work went into making that movement feel so good, well, I made a whole video essay touching on exactly that. And now, every time I go to unwind in Abzu's ocean, I see and feel the successes of Giant Squid's problem solution, and their ingenuity in their lighting engine. Seeing behind that curtain made everything even more impressive. Scrolling through interviews and articles and postmortems and GDC talks, that's a whole new level of appreciation that only deeper looks can really grant you. It's asking why, instead of just stopping at the this feels good to play statement. With enough thoughtful gaming behind us, we can go further than just knowing that we dislike roguelikes, for example. We can also discuss why we dislike Ori in the Blind Forest. For the record, floaty controls for a precision platformer, awkward combat, muddy visual design, rubber banding of the water in the Ginzo tree section, and bash. Just bash the whole, the whole thing. But I think this is where the analytical lenses of video game appreciation also do us a big favor, because I know a lot of people love that game, and I can appreciate why people would feel that way. There are just certain design choices that don't align with what I like in a game. So now when someone is shocked to find my opinion not matching their own, it's a lot easier to justify my dislike for the game, and maybe even start a healthy debate over what we like and dislike about a... Oh, Right, we're on the internet. I forgot. But without diving a little deeper into the games that I play, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly why this well-loved game felt so bad for me. And I wouldn't be able to tell you why The Outer Wilds was so incredibly captivating to me. Knowing nothing about what goes into game design, I would have most likely still enjoyed my time with the game. But having played a lot of other exploration-heavy titles like Subnautica in the past, I can tell you exactly why those weren't enjoyable for me, and why the Outer Wilds felt so incredible. The transition from on-the-ground movement to spaceship flight being so fluid, the shiplog's organization being so intuitive, the trail of breadcrumbs constantly leading you to two other bits of information, so you never feel lost or lacking in things to try. There's definitely a meme or two to be made of video essayists making five hour long deep dives into the design of a video game without having any actual experience with designing a game. And that in itself is a fair criticism, I think. But when it comes down to it, I think this is just another way for someone to passionately show their admiration for a game that really took an aspect of its creative design further than others. I don't personally know the lines of code required to make a character walk up a craggy mountain realistically, but I do know that I appreciate it and want to learn just a bit more about that process so I can admire the marvel of a game like Death Stranding, making walking feel engaging. Am I going to make a video essay about that hyperfixation in the near future? Definitely. Gaming is a $100 billion a year industry nowadays, and most of that money comes from the AAA market. There's plenty of games releasing annually, showcasing graphical improvements with very little creative design to go along with them. Another first-person shooter, another games-as-a-service. Of course, some bigger releases are given room to innovate, but when games do break the mold, I think it's important for us to look at why and how. Spoiler alert, it's almost never because of the graphics. Games stand out because of those cogs we talked about, not their clock face. All the hardware advancements and tech innovations mean nothing if they're not implemented in a way that encourages captivating design decisions. While those things are nice, none of it will stick with us unless the design is impactful. There are plenty of games that look beautiful, but if they don't encourage us to think, if they don't say anything, if they don't creatively engage us, it doesn't mean anything, right? Not that all games have to have some profound message or meaning behind them. There's a lot of value in turning your brain off with something stripped back and simple too. Not everything needs a three hour video essay made about it. Sometimes you just have to skate around an empty pool for an hour.
play Where's Waldo in a monochrome jungle. And solving some minimal puzzles by snapping Legos together really is a kind of meditation in itself. No theorizing, no themes to analyze, just vibing. You don't need me to tell you that letting your brain take a break is healthy. It's like letting your muscles rest between strenuous exercises. Not every day can be leg day, you know? Now, I'm not going to be the one to tell you about health and fitness, but it's a similar concept for sure. Our brain's analytical muscle is an important one to train, but it's just as important to let it rest too. And because games as a medium are so immersive, they can be a perfect tool for relaxation, just as they can be a tool for telling an engaging story. People whose minds at rest are already very active can find a lot of solace in games that ask next to nothing of the player. In fact, chill games like these are often used to mitigate the stress that our brains throw at us due to things like anxiety or ADHD. So while a player might be easily distracted in an open world game or overstimulated in something like Elden Ring, a game like Power Washing Simulator gives them a satisfying and straightforward gameplay loop for them to zone out with. Games that we've played over and over and over again can also work in a very similar way, because we know what to expect after so many playthroughs. So ironically, something like Dark Souls can actually do similar things for our brain as hidden folks might. Since we no longer have to wonder about what's around every corner, we can just enjoy the relaxation of moving through a world that we really connect with. It's like watching Schitt's Creek again for the 17th time since the start of the pandemic. Something to distract our brain long enough to just let us chill. So, Otter, I hear you asking, what is the point of analyzing a video game? I think being able to articulate why a video game connects with you or how its design fell short for you is really important. I think it can really increase your level of enjoyment of the gaming experience. Thinking critically about the media you interact with is an important part of not becoming a passive consumer. You can start looking at games as so many different things. As vehicles for learning empathy, for exploring points of view that you might not be familiar with, and most importantly I think, letting games open you up to thinking more about the world that we inhabit, how we interact, how we think, and who we are. Was that a pretentious enough way to end this video essay? Probably. Question for you though. What was the last game that you played that made you want to dive a little bit deeper and do a little bit of digging after playing it? Let's compare notes in the comment section. For me, it's gotta be Outer Wilds, obviously. But yeah, thank you so much for watching the video all the way through. I really appreciate it. I put over 40 plus hours into these video essays every single month. So hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel would really mean a lot. It helps the video get seen by more people and who doesn't love that, right? Speaking of helping out, thank you so much to my monthly supporters over on my Kofi. Voxamandius, Puzzled Monkey Tree, Mumpow, Dear Papaya, Oyster Milk, Nightmare God, Bean Fiello, Alien, and damn amazing. It's monthly supporters like these that make these videos possible in the first place. So if you also want to help out, you can become a monthly supporter for as little as $4. The link is in the description below. You'll get shout outs at the end here, extra content throughout the month, and sneak peeks at future videos. Also, if you want to check out any of the games I mention in any of my video essays for yourself, there's always affiliate links to them in the description that help out the channel and give back to charity at no extra cost to you. Plus, there's sometimes sales in there that Steam doesn't even have, so it's worth checking out. It's a win-win-win. Anyway, thank you again for all of the support on these videos. It really means the world to me. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!